Hello and welcome to That's Not Spit, It's Condensation. I'm Ryan Beach, and today I am joined again by my friend Ben Wright. Uh, we did an episode some time ago. I have no idea. Could have been a year, could have been 10 years, but some time ago. Four five, we did an episode. Yeah. Uh, Something, yeah. yeah. And uh, Ben is a member of the trumpet section of the Boston Symphony, as well as a teacher of trumpet at NEC. Uh, ben has also been posting a ton of content on his Instagram. Uh, during the pandemic, if I'm not incorrect, uh, you started to branch out and actually do a fair amount of online coaching, and you you branded it as T5, training trumpeters to train themselves, if I'm not incorrect about that, and then developed... A library, my assumption, is to be able to just provide access to your type of teaching without you having to be there for that. Yep. Uh, I want to talk about all of that, but I'd like to save it for the end so we can kind of get into the meat of the episode. So before we get into the meat of it, I just want to say thanks for giving me your time. I know you are a busy individual, lots of people asking for your time, so it means a lot that you give me some. Thanks. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Um, the premise of it, of this episode, is going to be about trumpet pedagogy and how we make decisions in our practice session and not, not so much what are practice strategies, but maybe when to employ those practice strategies and maybe if there's an order of operations so we can think about how to be very efficient with our time. So the way to start it out, I suppose, is you pick up a piece of music or an excerpt or something that you don't know at all and you're looking at it for the first time. What would be the first thing you would do or what would be the first thing you would encourage somebody else to do when they get started learning it? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and I, I love the topic. So um, this for me most commonly happens when we're playing uh, new music. So most of the time when I look at our uh, the Boston Symphony schedule, I see... Um, I see stuff that I know. So, you know, generally the the meat of the program, the main course of the program for you vegetarians is uh, a symphony that somebody's heard or a concerto with a big soloist or something like that. So then what I'm looking for is uh, I'm looking for names like Thomas Otis. Uh, I'm looking for uh, uh, Augusta Reed Thomas. I'm looking for composers whose pieces I know tend to be kind of hard. And so then I'll grab that part. I don't, uh, I know all the, I mean, I've been playing the standard repertoire of a major orchestra for 20, uh, four, 23 years. Um, so I don't generally have to, I mean, if it's something tricky that comes up, I'll look at it. Uh, you know, Petrushka second trumpet has got some stuff, um, et cetera. But generally I kind of just leave that for the first rehearsal. So I look at a new piece and, uh, first thing I'm going to do is open, you know, open it up and see how much black there is on the part. If there's a lot of black, <laughs> uh, you know, it catches my eye and I'm like, Oh, I got to look at this. Um, now I am not a good sight reader as Tom Rolfs can tell you. Um, and everybody that I play with, so Tom Rolfs, Tom Siders and Mike Martin, they are just stupidly good sight readers. Um, I don't know why that is. I mean, actually, I know why that is. Tom Tom grew up playing in a polka band, so he had to read different charts every time. Um, by the way, I think he had some sweet later hosen for that gig. Um, <laughs> I, I have asked him many times to 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 show up to an audition wearing those later hosen, and he he's he's passed. Um, sure. <laughs> I grew up. I grew up. Uh, Suzuki violin was my first um, kind of dojo for for playing an, an instrument, and that. Um, besides, uh, prematurely aging, my parents w was not good for sight reading. It's fantastic for ear training and, uh, musical development, but not great for your, for, uh, I didn't read music for the first four years. Right, right. Yeah. So anyway, so I have to take the music. I, I look at how hard it is and I'm good enough to sight read a lot of stuff, but, uh, uh an Augusta Reed Thomas piece or a Thomas Otis piece. Generally I'm not. So I'm going to take it, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to learn the rhythms, right? So uh, I'm going to learn the rhythms. I'm going to look for difficult fingering passages. I'm going to look for um, other high notes. Uh, you know, how in shape do I have to be to play this part? So 
Now, mm. when I was younger, I'd be like, what is this guy talking about? He has to be in shape. Well, I mean, look, you, you get, you know, I'm 48 years old. I have 14 year old twins and a lovely wife. And I have a, uh, I have a life outside of the orchestra. And so I have to make sure, okay. Uh, if we're going to play, uh, Thomas Otis, a uh, which is plural for asylum and has some of the craziest trumpet parts I've ever seen. Um, I got to be really ready. Um, yeah. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look and I'm going to, uh, just see about the rhythms and then I'm going to start practicing it. Uh, if it's fast and technical, I'm going to practice it slow and slurred. Right. And I get the topography of the, uh, uh, of the lick, you know, whatever it is. Um, if it's a, if it's a series of like, we play, um, some Carlos Simon stuff recently, which is fun. Um, and he likes to play around with kind of jazzy rhythms that are, uh, what's the, what's the word? Not uh, native to my musical language. Uh, sure, sure. I, I would say that Tom Siders can swing really hard on the trumpet. Uh, I wouldn't say that I do that. I can follow him quite nicely, but, uh, um, uh, it's not my, my, my regular thing. So I would spend a lot of time like learning the rhythms, uh, you know, cause when it comes down to it being practical, you don't want to play in the holes. So don't play in the empty spots, uh, and, and then slur. Right. So, and then start to build it up. If there's multiple tonguing involved, I'll, 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 I'll again, I'll start with the slur and I'll also multiple tongue really slowly. Um, so that I'm always trying to incorporate as many elements of the final product into the slow practice. I hear way too many people pick up the part and kind of stumble through just to get the notes. They're most concerned about the pitches and pitches are important for sure, but the structure is way more important, especially if you only have, you know, uh, a new piece. We might have a, a read through on Tuesday, maybe a rehearsal on Wednesday and then, and then the run through on Thursday and then we play it yeah. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So there's no, you know, you have to be practical. The first thing is the rhythm. Uh, you know, second thing is, uh, making sure you're close and then, and then you try to dial it in. Um, and ideally if I, there's something really hard on the schedule, I sort of look at it a few weeks in advance. I'm like, Oh, that's on my radar. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta learn that slowly. So I'm not trying to cram it. Like Siders is freaking incredible. He'll just be like, I'll be like, Hey, did you look at this piece next week? It's kind of hard. He's like, Oh no, no, I haven't done that. Um, <laughs> you know, part of that is he has really young twins. So he's, he's completely, he's in the middle of the, the blank storm right now. Do we swear on this? Or it's not like, no, probably not a swearing podcast. I try not to, yeah. but okay. Okay. You know, well, that'll we be... want it to be real and authentic. No, I mean, that'll be hard <laughs> for me. I, I tend to swear quite yeah, a lot. That's so, fair. Um, uh, my kids ask me often, do you really think that makes it more effective, dad? Okay. Anyway, so, uh, that's how I'd start. <laughs> if you, what, what, what else are you looking for here? I'm curious. No, that's really great. Um, I think what I, one of the things I liked about what you described for, for slow playing is that you're trying to get the topography, which is maybe your way of saying for me is just getting the, the architecture or it's like, you're trying to get the picture of what's happening in your brain before you really start trying to like dial in and refine the pieces. Yeah. Cause I'm sure you would agree. You know, that's, Go ahead. That, no, that's good. Um, uh, even more important for me is okay. <clears throat> so much of what we do with the volume of music we play and, and even saying that I know that freelancers often will play way more than what I do. So, but what I do is it feels like a lot of volume to me, meaning a lot of stuff. So I want to make sure, um, I can be as efficient as possible. So for me, topography is how high and low is it? How much am I leaping? You know, how much mm. effort do I need? Um, and, and the overall structure is excellent too. The other thing that I try to do is generally, I try to stay true to the dynamic and the character as I'm playing slowly. I don't like try to add those later. Um, it's mm -hmm. hard to add a lot of like power and uh, force when you're playing slowly because there's just, you do things kind of differently. Um, so it's, you know, it's, if it's supposed to be really like, you know, like bone crushing loud, I don't necessarily do that the whole time. Um, but if it's supposed to be soft, I do try to practice it soft. Yeah. 
So one of the things I want to dig into for you personally, and then maybe we could also talk about how you may recommend other, because not everybody's going to be at your skill level, right? You're sort of acknowledging that your ability to read and then your experience in and of itself mm -hmm. is you've done a lot of some of this yeah. work that we've talked about over the years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. For something like sight, for something like sight reading specifically, if someone, if you're, if I would mm. agree, the ability to sight read helps tremendously in the amount of material and you have way more than I do, obviously. Um, what kinds of tips, and if the answer is just do it more, that's an acceptable answer, but what kinds of tips do you have for people who want to develop this ability to sight read so that they, not so they can get better at all state things, but they have a more reliable starting point when they're trying to learn lots of music? Yeah, uh, good. Um, and thanks for asking me to rewind a little bit. Um, okay, so if I have a young player who's uh, not, fam maybe they need to improve their sight reading, um, I'll just turn to the back of the Arben book to the songs and say, okay, what's the first thing that you look at? Well, key signature, um, you know, if there's some Italian directions on what the speed is, you know, Adagio, Andante, uh, Allegro, Allegretto, Largo, um, et cetera. Um, you want to try to understand, I mean, it's like, kindergarten you want to follow the instructions right so some composers are really specific with their instructions some composers are not but that's the first place you look is what's the key signature what's the time signature what's the speed of the music and if you can tell the mood of the music if it's dolce that's pretty obvious um if it just says allegretto you know you don't really know if it's in three four and it's allegretto then maybe oh maybe that's a waltz one two three one two, three, whatever. Then you look for the fastest notes in the piece, right? And so you, you try to find, okay, this looks like the hardest thing. I'm looking at it, it's a little bit gnarly with the fingers. Or I have to make big leaps or whatever. That's where I set my tempo for my sight read, right? So mm -hmm. to me, the most important thing about sight reading is choose a speed you can kind of play and then don't stop right? Do not go back and fix. That's, I think that's as, as much of a universal rule as you can find with sight reading is just go through it. Um, be okay with missing notes, be okay with missing rhythms. Try to keep whatever the tempo is. And Chris Gecker was one of my, uh, uh, he, huge influence on my playing. Uh, I just studied with him for a summer, but he, he always, like to associate a physical movement with a tempo. So, you know, he would probably say, and, and I would agree with him when you sight read, put the tempo in your feet, you know, really, or tap your toe, you know, don't always do that because then your colleagues will get annoyed with you and reach over. And <laughs> I used to do that with, you know, it's like, remember, did I do that? Yeah. 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 My first gig at the Kennedy center, Tim white used to tap his foot all the time. I'd be like, Hey, cut it out. Once I had ten. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah. So is that? So yeah. So I would say like that's the first thing. Figure out where the fastest bits are, and choose your tempo from that. Um, and don't be overly. I, I would say if somebody's sight reading something, I'd rather hear them play it a little on the slow side, correctly or more correctly, than playing it too fast and stumbling through it or stumbling through the whole thing. Yeah. And you would agree that spending time specifically trying to develop your sight reading abilities yes. would be a valuable way to spend your time. Yeah. So my dad is like a was like a lights out clarinet player. He he he's mostly retired now. He's a really great clarinet player. So I grew up in a musical house, and he he taught at the local college and played in a quite fine regional orchestra. So I got a lot of advice growing up, um, and. I knew I couldn't sight read my way out of a paper bag. I was, I was just lost. Like I would constantly ask my first teacher, Mr. Burson, could you play that for me? He'd be like, you know, Benjamin, just this one time, he would always do it just this one time, but you really need to learn how to, you know, read the music. Um, and so, um, you know, dad came home one day and, and he had a stack of John Philip Sousa trumpet parts. Cause he, uh, at one point was the director of the wind ensemble at the, at the university where he taught. And he's like, you need to read through one of these 
every day. And it was like awful, just awful. And I still have a hard time reading Susan marches, which is ironic since I'm playing the Boston pops and we do play some Susan marches. Um, but that was, yeah. I mean, if you need to develop a muscle, you need to exercise it. So yes, I would start, you know, as a young player, uh, you know, start with a really basic, um, etude book you're not you know familiar with like if you don't have the conconi book you could read the basic conconi etudes um what's the other one there's a whole series of them whatever you like it doesn't just simple songs relatively tonal you know and then then you progress i mean you know as you get more advanced and you get in college, maybe you go to conservatory, you start reading things that are not tonal. And that's when it becomes very challenging. I have students sing things a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. Part of the reason for that being that the trumpet is not in tune the way it's built. Um, But Herseth used to tell me that his trumpet was tuned at the factory. Um, uh, I played with him for, for his last year in Chicago. And that was, I had, lots of um, learning experiences like that. Um, But if we teach ourselves to, to, to to be in the habit of singing, first of all, it helps. And immediately for, as a teacher, like if I ask a student sing something like, like they can't quite center on the pitches. Like, Oh, okay. You need to spend some time on the, on building up your ear training as you play a note on a piano and you sing it. And then you play that note on the piano and then you play another note on the piano and then you sing the two notes and you sing the leap. Um, and then you start to develop sort of relative pitch so that you can play in tune with yourself. Um, so with sight reading, eventually you want to try to give yourself a pitch and you, you can tap, you can thump the mouthpiece and give yourself an easy pitch. Or if you have a piano, that's great or a keyboard. And then, you try to sing from one pitch to another. Um, I used to kind of play tricks with myself with like, you know, I, I don't know, like maybe it's a bygone thing. I bet you had to do chores as a kid, right? You had chores at home. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I remember like, like I would be like vacuuming the stairs, right? You know, it's not, it's not a hardship. Everybody should do chores, but I'm like vacuuming the stairs, bored out of my mind and like practicing singing force in my head or, or practicing Clark, you know, to get the fingerings right. So, yeah, you know, you can get better at sight reading. I mean, my kids, both of my kids have perfect pitch. It's so annoying. So they can <laughs> sight read anything. Like my son, Ethan, when he was playing marimba, he could hear a movie theme and he would just go over, you know, he would like, he, we saw catch me if you can. He's like, da 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 dum, da 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 dum. Da did, da did, da did, da did. Like he could just go do that. But yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. Most people can't do that though. And, and I certainly yeah. can. So. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. And I, I'm a, I appreciate you sort of digging into sight reading because it sounds like, again, to some greater extent, it's a big part of your ability to quickly learn music. And it's like sort of an unspoken part of your process almost. Right. So then when you come to a piece of music that you don't know, there's sort of an amount that you're just not going to have to worry about mm-hmm. because you can read. And then on top of that, you're then saying, okay, what are the things I do need to worry about? Mm-hmm. And then also, you know, there are some rehearsals and things, and you know, that especially with a piece that's modern, sometimes I'm just like, you know what? I'm not going to put a lot of effort into this until I actually know what it's supposed to sound yes, like right. in context. That's a huge part for me. Yeah. So, that's for you, which is super valuable. Let's talk about somebody who may not have the skill that you have, who is going to be experiencing a fair amount of trumpet production related problems where they actually need to work through the process. Mm. Um, you know, maybe someone that's working through an audition list with you who's having some issues with it. When you're first tackling maybe an unfamiliar or very difficult excerpt, um, do you like, let's say something like Petrushka, Ravel, Piano Concerto, uh, Scheherazade, things mm. like that and they're struggling, um, what are some of the recommendations? Obviously, maybe slowing it down will be the first one, but I can't imagine it just stops there. So if you can maybe even conjure up working with somebody to kind of walk us through how you may have helped somebody with who doesn't have the same kind of developed skill that you do. Okay, so I had uh, a player come to me 
but several several players come to me uh, preparing for the North Carolina Symphony audition, which is ongoing or something. And this particular player came in and played an excerpt, and it didn't sound like they understood the mood that they were supposed to put out there. So if you're playing a piece of music that has been recorded by someone who plays at a higher level than you, uh, or even just plays well, <laughs> um, you should listen to that recording. Um, if it's available now for sight reading, it, it sounds like we're kind of, we're, we're leaving sight reading a little bit. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I'm sort of, yeah, yeah. If that's okay. Good. Oh, please God. Yeah. Cause I <laughs> sight reading the bane of my existence. Uh, I mean the first few years playing, you know, I played, I started in Chicago symphony. I started at Ravinia where you play three different programs a week. And I didn't know the standard repertoire like I do now. And the same thing in Tanglewood yeah. and then pops pops. We used to play like four, four programs a week. And you do that for uh, six weeks in the spring. And often we like, I remember playing uh, fanfare for uh, new England with John Williams conducting. He's like, you know, folks, I feel like we just did this last year. So we're just not going to rehearse this. And I'm like, okay, I'll, uh, I'll go work on that. Right. <laughs> sure. So, so, those are extreme examples, but as far as like excerpt preparation, it's an excerpt. Please, 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 please don't start practicing it until you've heard what it's an excerpt from, right? This particular player had been through a lot of schooling with good teachers. Um, and just, uh, uh, either hadn't had the time or whatever. And I was like, so who'd you listen to play this? Right. And there's, a million good orchestras out there. Um, there's also some pretty not great recordings on YouTube, right? Don't choose the first thing you see on YouTube. Try to find a high quality example. Part of the reason I spent hundreds of hours creating my sound truth library. And let me just say that the reason why I call it the sound truth library is I recorded it with the microphone here, right? So here, 18 inches from my bell and measured it once. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and the idea was you're practicing something at home. You need to hear how that thing is supposed to sound. Boom. You just go to one of the 220 videos on my, in my library, you press play and you listen to it. It doesn't need to be me. It could be Dave Bilger. It could be this. There's a kid in Spain who's putting out, of course, his name is eluding me right now. Who's putting out tremendous videos every, every, every day. It could be, yeah. it, it could be you. It could be, uh, somebody on the West coast, somebody in Asia, I, I don't care if it's a very high quality example, then listen to it and imitate it. Right. Until you can do it as well as that person and then move on. Right. Like I remember listening to, um, Phil Smith, uh, in the excerpt CD, a CD is a, a, a round shiny object that spins. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, for you, our, you know for our listeners who don't know, yeah, you, you know, this, you know, this, you're, you're, <laughs> I do. you're, you're you're just old I've enough. held one, but yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, but no, I remember listening. That was my only reference. And so I would listen to like, I, I could listen to him play Leonore three and I'd be like, Oh, and this was like when I was a very advanced uh, student and early professional. I was like, Oh, I, I got that. I, I can play that at the same level as Phil Smith, but Trushka, not so much. Right. So you continue to listen to better examples until you can do that. Well, and I feel like there's not enough, see it throughness built into the culture right now. It's all about trying to grab bits and pieces. Uh, another story, I'm fantastic grad student at NEC right now. Um, uh, I'm telling the story on you, Nelson, really great student. Love him. He, I asked him to carpool with me to this. It's a long story, but he was in the, we had a two hour car ride. And I said, hey, do you know Sarah Willis's video where she's in the MRI and you can see her, um, you, you can basically see what her tongue and her lungs and all kinds of stuff are doing while she's playing. He said, no, 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 I haven't seen that. And so, okay, well, we got plenty of time. Just pull it up and watch the whole thing, right? So I said, watch the whole thing. It's not going to bother me. Just do it right now. I'm not kidding you. He pulled it up and watched four 15 second sections and said, wow, that's really cool. Then, <laughs> I looked at him and was like, what part of listening to the whole thing did you miss, man? How long is the whole video? Well, it's eight minutes. Well, you got seven to go. 
right? <laughs> you know, and this wow, is a, yeah, this yeah. is a great student, right? So listen to it in context. Um, uh, look at a score. If you can find a score, that'd be great. See how it fits in. For instance, uh, first uh, the the uh, beginning of Beethoven five fourth movements showing up on a lot of auditions, right? Especially second trumpet auditions. I don't know the first hundred measures or something. I don't know whatever the excerpt is. Yeah, yeah. It goes on for a while. There's one dynamic, fortissimo, right? Bum 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 bum. Right? Bum And then what we do in the orchestra, is, as you know, yeah. we go from fortissimo to like mezzo piano, right? So this young player comes in, is playing Beethoven, and it's like, uh, no, yeah, yeah. So I mean, and that's relatively advanced, but also, uh, you know, and yes, you you're supposed to follow the composer's instructions, but part of that is if you can hear what the composer wrote and you hear like an orchestra play it, then you 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 make adjustments. Yeah, sure. And this for me, I. I... I love this as a starting point because you're obviously talking about like what you hear in your head is going to dictate everything about the way you practice it. Right. Like it's going to mostly just dictate where you're headed and, and, and like sort of the goal post of what would be successful. Cause I have felt in my own practice and I'm sure others can identify that sometimes it's hard to define if I've accomplished something in my practice session. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know where you're headed, you don't know if you've moved closer to that. So having some, some definition of this is what I'm looking for. And obviously it being informed by recordings and other great players can help that process of it will take some time to get there. Right. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you want to speak to speak to sort of the process of it takes some time to work it out. Yeah. But if you don't have a picture of what you want, it's like impossible for you to actually know if you're headed in that direction. Yes. Yes. So we have to have, so uh, Vince Chickowitz, who was Tom Rolfe's teacher at Northwestern and uh, very nearly was the, the teacher that I went to study with for undergrad and going to Cleveland, let's say with Michael Sachs, um, he used to call it modeling, right? So mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're, again, you're hearing the best possible example and then you're modeling, right? So if you're going to learn Petrushka for the first time, first of all, enjoy yourself, right? It's awesome. It's also deceptively challenging. It's this very simple thing and you have to play it on every audition you'll ever take for playing classical music ever. So listen to 10 different trumpet players play it, right? And now you can do that. It's so easy, right? It, it drives me crazy. People say, oh, um, do you have a website? And I'm like, yeah. Do you know about Google? So go to Google and put my name in and put trumpet after it. And there's like, whoo, all kinds of stuff. It's unbelievable. Like, what, how, why is it so difficult? I don't understand that. Okay, old man moment there. That's going to be a clip. Yeah. I'm clipping that. Okay, good. Yeah, I want that. I want it. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I got distracted. You were talking about modeling. Modeling. Okay. Oh, Okay. Players that are winning auditions right now. Um, wow. It, it, it is so clear that the first goal of a lot of players is precision, right? Don't miss, right? And so 90% of people come to me and they're, and, and they're maybe 95%. No, nah, 90, whatever. We're not talking about hundreds of people who come to me preparing auditions, they play it and it is like listening to like audio cardboard. It's like, sure. It's, it's accurate. It's correct. Uh, it, it does not go outside any lines whatsoever, but what yeah. drives me crazy about it is that, that a lot of people right now are approaching things from the idea. Okay. I want, um, I want to play this and not miss. And so what I've been trying to do with everybody is what's the character play it in character. Once you play it in character and you miss a bunch of stuff, 
that's when you go to your training and say, Hey, why am I missing that leap? What, what am I doing? You know, why is it that when I come in on an offbeat, I often miss the first note? Oh, well, often what people do when they come in on an offbeat is they try to breathe in that little tiny rest. That's the offbeat for Petrushka. One, two, mm, mm, mm. right. My lips are closed and ready for that offbeat. If I try to go, I get a crummy breath. My lips aren't really together and maybe I'll hit the notes. Maybe I won't. So you have to practice it in character and get your consistency from there. Right. So my strength was never not missing. Probably still isn't. My strength was always, whoa, that was really, you know, convincing. Right. So I would just go for it every, every time. Right. And I got lucky in my first couple auditions that I won that the excerpts that they asked me to play were right in my wheelhouse. Um, sure. if I had to step out of that, I have a problem. So that was really lucky and fortunate for me. Um, but now auditions are much more, um, like when I took the second trumpet audition for the BSO where it's like the whole phone book and littered with high C's and technical hard stuff, even for second trumpet, it's no longer like a low seat. Everybody is a utility player. They have to be able to play all over the horn. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that always playing things in character is really important. And then you get your consistency from there. Yeah, I, again, I, we were talking beforehand. I'm going to say, like, I agree as if that now means that it's true or something like that. But it, it, it just, I've learned that you want to find the filter through which you begin doing your work, because if not, you're like working on something else. And then when you try to put it into context, it's going to feel different. So through this lens that you're saying, where we're going to listen to the piece, we're going to study the score, we're going to get a, a clear, maybe less, you know, listening to other great players, we're going to get a clear picture of what's going on. When you begin to encounter problems at that point, now this is where it's going to get a little harder to have hard and fast rules, right? Because it's all going to be completely dependent on what the problem is and who the player is. But do you have sort of a general order of operations? You may begin to try to diagnose what's wrong. Mm. For example, for me, I might say, let's play it slower to figure out, can you not play this or is it just too fast for you? Mm. Or I might say, let's slur it to see, is your airstream the problem mm. or something like that, right? Mm. Do you have sort of a, a diagnosing method that you may go through to say, let's find out which problem it may be so that we can address that problem? It's a good question. No, I don't have a, um, I don't have a, I don't want to call it pat method or like, I, I don't, I don't want to say that's not the way to do it. Right. But for me, everybody's different. And, yeah. and, I remember when I got to know my wife, then girlfriend, and she she would say, well, you have to teach the player where the player is, right? So somebody might come in, somebody came in recently and said, you know, I really want to advance around. And I'm listening, I'm like, well, maybe we could talk about a different goal, which is you want to play at the audition how you play, right? You You, you want to achieve whatever your current level is instead of reaching for some vague thing of, I, I want to advance. So I could have spent 45 yeah, that, minutes with this person on Petrushka, but this person wanted to work through the excerpt. So we just did kind of bits and pieces and, you know, with a player of more ability, I'm going to dig in way further. Right. Um, yeah, with less ability, it might work on the fundamentals of breathing. You know, like when you were a student at Tanglewood, I wouldn't have touched your fundamentals of breathing or your physical production or any of that stuff. Partially because when you were a student there, I didn't know really much about that stuff. I've learned that recently. Um, but there were certain things you did, like you would play too brawny and be like, well, Hey, you know, like, uh, we can't have just one variety of, um, of trumpet. Right. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So I think probably for me, what's the sound? What's the character? And then from there, you get all kinds of things. You know, uh, the, the sound is affected by the volume. Uh, the, the sound is, you know, um, there's the, the character... You know, if you're playing something that's got dotted eights and sixteenths and you're playing triplets instead of sixteenths, the character is not going to be right. If you play triplets in Shostakovich 5's March, it sounds happy. It's like tanks, you know, rolling in, you know, it's like, you know, yeah. it's not happy music. Um, somebody played Bordoni uh, 2. It has in the middle of 30 second notes. So be da, 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 and they played da, 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 in that case, the slower rhythmically incorrect notes actually made it sound more laid back. Like the mood is indicated, mm-hmm. but that's not the deal. The composer wrote 30 second notes. So yeah, maybe they wanted you to learn how to do it that way. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm wandering at this point. No, it's okay. I, I'll tell you why I'm asking the question, and then maybe that can help kind of, you can give some general comments. I think the reason I'm asking this question is to some degree, we may all have a different definition of the word practice. Mm. And then we have some people who are very efficient practicers and some people who aren't. And so I, I mm. like I said, I understand it's difficult to answer the question that I'm asking, but I'm sort of looking for if someone is in the practice room and they're stuck and they need to go about solving problems, is there some sort of loose order of operations they could follow that you would recommend to to help them find more effectively find the problems they're having? Mm. Uh, does that question make sense? Yeah, yeah. So what's the first thing somebody hears when they hear you play? They hear your sound. Your sound. Right? Yeah. And then after you've played two notes, assuming that it's not uh, two fermatas, they have some concept of the sound, right? So Schumann 2 is like not a great example of that because you got two slow notes. But as soon as you hear da-da, da-da, yeah, da-da-da, that's the tempo. As soon as you play your 16th note, that's your tempo. So I would say if you don't know if you're sitting in a practice room and you're like, I just don't know how to make this better. Obviously based on things that I've been spouting quite a bit on Instagram, the first thing to do is to go listen to a good example. It just so happens I've got you covered. Um, (laughs) If that's not available in your practice room, which my library is, um, if it's not available in your practice room, then go through your fundamentals. How's your sound? Is it, uh, is it even, do you want it to be even do you, do you, what character do you want the sound to imbue? What is the music asking for? Right? So for instance, the bottom of the, uh, first page of Mahler five, at least one of the additions, to the bottom of the first page is that section that's, that's lab- labeled wild, right? That yeah. is one sound, one time in an audition where you're going to, you're going to play with, sort of this kind of sound is the muscular sound and a, 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 maybe even a little edge, a little wild. Right. right. So, you know, well, it takes a lot of strength to, to hold all that air back. Right. So you, if you're blowing the seal and you can't get up to the notes or whatever, then, then that's a good indication. Okay. In my practice over the next week or two, I need to add a little bit of loud playing. And so I think, what people tend to do on the trumpet where we make mistakes as trumpet players is we, we, if trumpet playing is driving a car, it's like we drive the car like this. We overcorrect, right? Um, old cars you used to be able to drive like this. Cause there's tons of power steering my high school car, the 78 Monte Carlos total piece of junk. I had to drive it like this to go straight. I digress. <laughs> sure. So, um, I also lost the train of thought. Uh, 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 You're saying we overcorrect when we, oh, when oh, we have yeah. our, our okay. issues. So we tend to overcorrect. Um, a, an excellent reason student. Hey, when you take a breath, it sounds, uh, it sounds like your lips are like ready to play the tuba. So it's like, <gasps> at the top of the breath, your lips are this far apart. We, you can't play the trumpet with your lips this far apart. Maybe you can do a tuba that way, but it's a trumpet, right? 
So, yeah, so he, yeah. ma- he made a good adjustment, but he over adjusted. And then the next lesson he came in, he was like, you know, it's like, okay, well that's maybe a little tight, right? So we have to find the happy medium. So be careful about over adjusting. I need to learn how to play loud, play loud, play loud. Like, well, no, because then what you're going to do is you're just literally going to punch yourself in the face. And then you're going to, sure. you're going to go to your teacher and say, I don't know what the problem is. I just worked on loud playing for one day and I'm, I'm torched. Well, of course you're torched. The muscles are like, you, you got very limited real estate here and you're taking a piece of metal and pressing flesh against bone, right? You're going to, mm-hmm. you know, you have to do it slowly and our culture does not like slow, but you want to add things in a little bit at a time and see how they work. You know, one of the things that, you know, I had a few lessons with Charlie Geyer, fantastic teacher, fantastic teacher, great human being. Um, and he said, you know, really, you should be able to take actionable advice, good advice from a, 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 a I don't want to say reputable, uh, a capable source and do it, right? So like, apply it every day. And if you do it for five days and you're not seeing improvement in what you wanted to improve, then maybe it's not either, either there's a problem with the execution or there's a problem with the thing. And that's, that's when you go to a teacher. So, right. So the, my whole thing is like, let's figure out how to teach ourselves training trumpet, training trumpeters to teach themselves. Right. Because I got so sick of this whole like hero worship. Oh, I have to go study with this teacher and I, I can't leave this teacher after four years. I have to stay for an, I have to study with the master or, or mistress for forever. It's like, well, no, you need to figure out how to learn and figure out how to teach yourself. And that was my favorite thing about Mark Gould. First lesson, he said, Benny, Benny, you got to figure this out, man. You got to get out of school and figure it out, you know, and, and true yeah. his word. And, and then it's not to say that like, you know, you shouldn't study with somebody for six years. Maybe it's great. I don't know. Elmer studied with me for three and a half years and then moved to Tom Rolfs and studied with Tom for, I don't know, two and a half years before he started winning auditions, you know, or doing Elmer things. So (laughs) it's good to cross pollinate. The more you can get like good information from other people and kind of layer it in there, then you can kind of lay all that out on a table. And this is what I tell people, you know, especially older players like, Hey, you got to lay that stuff out and figure out, okay, well, is that working? You know, is that habit serving me? Great book by, uh, uh, James clear atomic habits, James clear, yep. the James clear, something yeah. clear. Yeah. Atomic habits make little changes. Right. And then you get, you get big results down the road. Right. So yeah, somebody's, we go back to model five wild isn't working. Right. Okay. Well, maybe you need some long tones for five minutes max per day and you, and you add it in there and then you start to develop the, 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 whatever strength you need to funnel all that air through the right size hole to get the airspeed to make it work. So, but, but if you do too much too soon, you get injured and then, you know, well, you begin to tell yourself a story that I can't do that or that's not for me, which is like a whole problem in of itself that no, it's not that you can't do it. It's that you approached it not in a way that would serve you. And I think the amount that I've learned over the years about working out and how incremental the progress is, is certainly helpful, but also just the idea that if I can bench 225 right now and I want to bench 315 someday, just benching 315 over and over is not going to get me where I want to go. Rather, I should work at 225, maybe 235, you know? You start to slowly work within the means of where you're at, trying to orient yourself towards where you want to go. So I appreciate that perspective. You're talking... Can I just say, to be clear, or to, to, to back that up, what you're saying is, okay... I want to play also Sprock Zarathustra. So 315 on a, on a bench press for you is 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 uh, a, a student at um, X University's uh, also Sprock Zarathustra, right? So da 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 dee, right? So if you go at that high C and just keep failing, well, you're just going to keep failing. You have to work. You have to start where you can kind of do it, and then start to move the move that line a little bit. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
that would be, I feel like we could even just pick that example apart and begin to talk about it. But I know that we don't have the time to do that right now. So maybe some other time you're talking a lot about uh, listening and uh, you know, what does the sound need to be? And if you're not there, then how do we move closer to that? I think one important part of this entire process is going to be recording yourself then. Mm. Obviously, a teacher is going to give you that feedback. But when you're on your own, mm. recording yourself is really the only way to get accurate feedback on how close you are. Mm. So I would love your thoughts on how much to record, yes. when you would yes. include it, all that. Okay. I ask my students to record every lesson so they can listen when they do things that work. Yes, they can listen to me play stuff, and often that's helpful. Um, but people come in with an iPhone, right? So they come in with an iPhone. What does an iPhone cost? Well, your parents pay for it. That's great. So, but an iPhone costs a thousand bucks, right? A decent recorder, like uh, you know, this is not a decent recorder. It's good for uh, video. Uh, it's good for Instagram clips. It's good for basic stuff pitch rhythm it's not good for volume you can't hear you can't really hear much of a phrase through an iphone unless you've got some sort of aftermarket technology which most people don't so get something you can get a plug-in microphone for for an iphone and it's better than an iphone right exactly you can get yeah you can get a uh you can get a flash recorder from zoom or tascam or you know I'm not up on all the different companies now, but um, 150 bucks, 200 yeah. for something that's pretty actually good. And you're going to need it all over the place. So yes, you should record yourself. I don't recommend it for more than once a week. Um, and, mm. and the reason is you need time to practice stuff to improve. And so if you, if you play something and let's say you had a, a little bit too much, too much extra, you know, Kung Pao beef for dinner and your lip is a little fried from the spice. And then you go and practice something and it sounds bad and you record yourself like, Oh, I'm not getting better. I'm regressing. Sure. That's not useful. So practice something for a week, record it, listen to it, evaluate. If you don't know what to do, that's when you go to see a teacher. I don't know if you're studying with a teacher, you go to see the teacher regardless. But if you're not and you're out on your own, that's how you get better. Play something. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm working on an audition. I'm going to play Cinderella. So I'm going to play it how I play it the first time and we'll record it. And then I listen back and I'm like, oh, I need to work on X, Y, and Z. So for a week, 10 days, I work on X, Y, and Z. And then I record, I record it again. And then I see if I've moved the sticks, little football reference mm -hmm. there. Have I moved the sticks? Am I any closer to a first down? Usually you will be, but then it's like whack-a-mole. Maybe one thing is better, but the rhythm is not good or, you know, whatever. Maybe you don't know. Well, then you send the clip to somebody who does, right? Uh, com yeah. Compare. I mean, that's the whole thing with my library. Listen to me play Petrushka, then play it. Listen to your recording, then listen to my recording. Is it as good as mine? No, then keep practicing, right? Just sure. In that way, it's relatively simple. It's not simple to play the trumpet. It's not easy to play the trumpet. Um, I think you can find improvement that way. Don't record yourself too often. I would say maximum once a week. Otherwise, you'd start to go, uh, you start to get a little mental about it. Sure, sure. Makes perfect sense. If you're okay with this, I'd like to try to recap some of what you talked about into some version of an actionable plan. Mm -hmm. And then I would love to, to uh, sort of, um, you've, you've certainly talked about your, the T5 and the, and the library and things throughout, but if you want to kind of give like, uh, a, an elevator pitch, so to speak. So we kind of get the full picture of what it's all about. Mm -hmm. I'd love for that. Mm -hmm. And then we can end. I know you, you don't have much more time here. So mm -hmm. We talked about you and how you would approach something in the orchestra. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to look through the season schedule to find things of composers that you recognize that you know are hard or maybe pick up music of composers you don't recognize and open it up and just look. Is this going to be something that is going to be beyond my ability to sight read it? 
And if that's the case, you'll probably extract those difficult things. You're going to play things slower and you're going to play it slurred so that you can figure out more or less how to navigate it. How do I get up to this higher note? How do I use my air? How do I want to play these lower notes? And you try to, to the best of your ability, keep the elements of the performance in the slower tempos. So you're going to double tongue at slower tempos. You're going to try to play the same volumes or close to the same volumes, depending on what it is, so that you're really... If I uh, this is me interjecting an assumption, but my assumption is is that you want to be just grooving that neural pattern as much as possible while making allowance for it to be a little bit easier while you're learning. That's yes. my assumption. Yes, and also so that you're not learning it out of without all these contextual things. You practice something slow that's multiple tongue, then you're single tonguing. You're 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 practicing. You're on the to, to talk about neural pathway. You're on the wrong path. <laughs> Like right, not even right. the right zip code. Right, yeah. We, that could be a whole episode too. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of thoughts on that. And then we talked a little bit about sight reading too, because again, it's sort of an implied or I don't want to say unspoken because you obviously addressed it, but somewhat of an unspoken part of your process that the amount of your ability to sight read that you've developed plus the experience that you have is part of how you're able to digest and read music. And if somebody doesn't have those skills developed or the same kind of experience you do, then they're going to maybe turn to some of those, the art of phrasing and the Arbin, and you're going to start looking at key signature, the Italian words, just trying to figure out what are the instructions mm -hmm. so that I understand what style, what sound, what, what tempo, but specifically related to tempo, you're also going to try to find among the more difficult parts and use that as your reference for mm -hmm. specifically sight reading, not necessarily for a performance because you would be able to work it up to whatever tempo you wanted. Mm -hmm. And then you want to, uh, yeah, you talked about needing to just practice. You talked about the Sousa marches and needing to just practice sight reading. And uh, if someone doesn't have access to that, again, starting with Easy Arbin or Concone, Getchel's would probably be pretty solid. Getchel, that's, the, that's the series. Yes, Getchel, very good. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a book I worked out of by uh, uh, his last name is LaCour and uh, they're very short etudes and I, I use them as sort of a progressive or my teacher used them as a progressive way to see different rhythms and different difficult things but the, the, originally it's a sight reading book you just read through and it gets progressively more difficult so something like that and then we moved into talking about how you might, if you're someone who does not have the same kind of developed skill, the same kind of mental representation you do that guides things. Um, as a sidebar, I've been, I, I taught on Monday at the school that I teach at, and I ended up spending a fair amount of time talking about developing the sound in your head. And it was interesting because I was using sort of visualization to do it. Like, I want you to close your eyes and like really try to hear the sound really loud. Mm -hmm. And as I was explaining it to them it was like i could hear my own sound while i was talking it's like that imprinted and so that's kind of the direction we're trying to head in with listening and score study is you want you don't want to just know how it goes you want it to be like imprinted inside of you that you're it's just what comes out of your bell is what's inside of you so spending mm -hmm. a fair amount of time making sure you understand the context what sound you're going after mm -hmm. and just what elements maybe what technical elements like articulation volume things like that will contribute to the thing you're trying to do and then you're basically using recordings of people, whether it's through an actual recording or maybe like a Phil Smith or your library to compare and contrast and continue to ask, well, I've certainly gotten better, but what other things can I do? You need to record yourself, but from your perspective, because obviously everyone's got a different opinion about recording, but for you, not recording yourself too often, once per week maximum to make sure that you are allowing time to actually improve. And, um, I think beyond that, the only other thing I feel like you said that I really liked is that you were saying when you're learning Petrushka for the first time, enjoy it. It's going to be something that's going to live with you. And I think in general, it's a cool way to see it that when we pick up new music, it's this opportunity to like explore something we don't know versus I now have to learn this thing and mm -hmm. that's going to be hard. So I appreciate that perspective. Um, if you have any closing thoughts, that's fine. But if not, I would love for you to have an opportunity just to talk about why you started T5, kind of where it's at right now, and then your uh, Sound Truth library. Yeah, so I think it's an excellent uh, summation. Um, and I, I, lo I love what you're doing because you're trying to 
trying to get people, give them more information, right? Um, so I, I started T5 during the pandemic uh, because my kids weren't vaccinated. And I was home for, I don't know, many months. Um, and also, it was a time in my life that I, the first time in my life in, in many years that I had time to practice. I did things like I read Thus Spake Arnold Jacobs, right? Because I've been playing with Tom Rolfs, who actually studied with Arnold Jacobs at Northwestern. But I never had a lesson with Arnold Jacobs. I didn't understand his concepts. So it was kind of fun. I, I read a book. Um, it's a pretty boring <laughs> book. It is it is dry. It is bone dry. Um, but it was really interesting, and it really informed some of the stuff I've been hearing Tom play or say the stuff that I heard Tom say, and then also the things that he does when he's, when he's playing. So also it, it gave me time to, um, sort of integrate Alexander technique, which by the way is mm -hmm. a huge amount of what Arnold Jacobs taught. Um, if you, if you don't know Alexander technique, everybody should check it out. Um, uh, uh, the readers digest, uh, description of that is how to use your body the way it was intended to, to be used to be more efficient with, with your, your physical self. Um, there's a lot of psychology that goes into it too. It's fantastic. Um, it's definitely changed my life. And I, I feel like the changes it's made in my trumpet playing will allow me to play for as long as I want. Um, mm. so, uh, which is re really pretty cool, right? Cause I, yeah, I, I, I was, sure. I was, I was having trouble with physical breakdown, um, overuse. Uh, I, I didn't get into any, uh, any kind of dystonia, but like that might've been on the menu of eventually for me. And so what I learned, I wanted to share with students and I got really comfortable teaching online. I'm still incredibly comfortable teaching. If the student has even a hundred dollar microphone, uh, and a decent webcam, meaning also a hundred dollar webcam, I don't need a decent webcam. I just need a decent microphone. Um, and, and good internet speed, I can help anybody get better. Um, I'm doing a lot less of that now and I'm focusing on, so I, I spent hundreds of hours creating this library because what I wanted to be able to do was, Hey, you need a little work on your multiple tonguing. So go to, there's three, uh, videos covering my favorite exercises in Arbon, for instance, there's a whole fundamental section covering Arben Schlossberg Clark, and it's not one big video, it's separate videos, right? So you, you, you just go through and it goes through the book. Hey, here's page, whatever. This is how I play. I play page 18 in the Arben book. This is why I, 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 I do it this way. And this is what it sounds like, by the way, this is what it sounds like. And this is really important for me in the room where I'm sitting. So in the room where you're sitting in your practice room, just imitate this sound, right? So there's all kinds right. of great recordings of the world's best players playing in these boomy concert halls by themselves. Well, that's great. And I spent a lot of time imitating uh, my teachers, predominantly Mike Sachs, because he's who I study with uh, undergraduate. And I would imitate what I heard in Severance Hall sitting in the back. And that's not what you should be imitating. You have to imitate what you hear in the room because that's what we're really doing on stage. So that was, yeah. that's why I called it Sound Truth Library. Uh, it's the sound we actually make on stage. It's smaller. It's more compact. Um, it's tongier. Uh, you hear more stuff in a smaller room. So that that's important to me, right? And and what I what I I see with my students is when they really use it well. And by that I mean, hey, go work on multiple tonguing. Check out this video for the week. They come back, and it's much better than if they just heard me do it once in the lesson, right? So right, they, there's. Right. I don't want people sitting in a lesson or in a, in a practice room banging their head against the wall. Why do that? Right. So here's this, here's this library with 200 videos. You can, you can listen to fundamentals. You can listen to excerpts. There's a very large section of things where you play along with me. Do you not know how to play in the classical style? Like the huge proportion of even really good trumpet players, young trumpet players, Beethoven, uh, Brahms, you can play along with me playing Brahms two, uh, Beethoven five, uh, later pieces, Till Owen, Spiegel, Shostakovich five. You can take any part and you just play along with it. Right. So you get the style, right. Um, it's pretty cool. Is it as good as sitting in the room with me or 
some other teacher who has a job like me or plays like me or whatever. No, it, but is it a really good practice aid? Yeah, it's phenomenal practice aid. I would have killed for yeah. that to be able to. Hear, yeah, yeah. I mean, to be able to hear Mike Sachs play in my lesson, like that was like solid gold. Like that's all I wanted. Like, oh, just please play today. But he's a principal trumpet player. He can't play in every lesson. It's probably different now. I mean, I studied with him like you know five thousand years ago, um, but. In that time, I, I always wanted more of that. And so that's why I did this. It's like, okay, this is a resource. And I tried to, you know, for a while it was only available for my full-time students. And and then I, you know, put a bunch of work into the infrastructure so that I could make it like sort of a subscription. So now people can can get it. It's like, uh, what does it work out to? Six cents a minute uh, for the whole year, right? So, uh, no, I don't mean to average over the number of minutes in the year. I mean, there's... 20 hours of material and it's about, yeah. it's a little bit, it's, it's a uh, $79, right? So for a whole year, right. And I would argue that, especially if you're using it, like I suggest where you're listening to examples, you know, you, you might, it might take a while to get your Alpine symphony up to as, as well as what I'm doing. It's right. hard, right. It's challenging, right? So just go back and listen to it again. And that's the idea of like, okay, a year long, take a year, Use this as a practice aid. You can pull it up on your phone. You can pull it up on your tablet, whatever. Any any place you have an internet connection, you just need the interweb. <laughs> yeah. Well, and obviously one of the other main benefits is it's like someone can have access to you and your thoughts. I don't know what your lesson rate is, but if it's $79, you can get like one lesson worth of information. Yeah. It's my lesson rate is or, way more than $79. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and yeah. you can have it for a year and you can have it as much as you want, you know, all of those things. Um, I know, like I said, I know you got to go. I want to say one last thing and then I'll let you sort of plug your, you know, I just want to say for me, I have not yet encountered or looked into your sound truth library, but I can say for certain that some of the most transformational experiences I had at Tanglewood, where those classes were you and Tom, we would just sit right next to you and play. Mm -hmm. To actually hear what you sound like and then try to imitate that was by far the most transfer transformational part of that. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to, whenever I've been in a situation with students, I've tried to go do that where I just sit right next to them and play. Mm -hmm. Because although talking about it is great, there's a something about hearing it and feeling it and all that kind of stuff. So if it's anything like that, what that experience was for me at that time, especially what I needed to hear professionals. Yeah. It would be more than more than worth the, the, the investment, you know, it's a minimal investment for the amount of value I think you're getting. So I think that's cool because yeah, it was transformational for me. People can go check it out. Also those, those types of things on YouTube or uh, YouTube that have those Tanglewood classes. So yeah, that's probably what it's like. Um, in fact, I think you're, if you you, you're, click you're in that video, aren't you? I know. Yeah. My favorite part of that video mm -hmm. is that someone commented and said, that fat guy sounds better than the pros talking about me. <laughs> and then somebody else commented and yeah. said, that fat guy is a pro. And yeah. I was like, hold on just a second. Yeah. I'm more concerned about this fat guy yeah. part, but yeah. no one seemed yeah. to. <laughs> hey, hey, we don't say that anymore. That's not okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Anyway, if you want to plug your uh, Instagram website, no, all that I mean, kind of stuff, look, so people look, know I mean, where to find you, I'd love yeah, to. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty simple. It's Ben Wright Trumpet. Go to the Google. You can go to the <laughs> the website called Google and put in Ben Wright Trumpet, and you know you'll come up with the links. My, I've got a bunch of free stuff on YouTube. Um, there's a tour on my website, which is benwrighttrumpet.com. Uh, it's called the sound truth library. It's right there on the page. Just click on it. Um, and there's a tour of what's in there. Um, uh, uh, you know, a description of what I hope it will be and how it will help people. And, um, you know, uh, actually, uh, I mean, I, I try to, I try to do, I'm, I, when I'm on vacation from the orchestra, I try to post more on Instagram, just like simple little helpful things. Um, I'm on a, I'm on a breathing kick right now. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm interested in things I don't know about. Right. And so I would say, be curious, um, read a book, um, listen to something you're not used to listening to, you know, um, I had a student this week who his assignment was to listen to at least half an hour of, uh, opera highlight arias, um, mm. you know, to, 
try to really connect with that emotional kind of content of the music and feel that kind of joy and have that come through the trumpet and not be worried quite so much about like um, playing it perfectly or not missing. Right. Sure. Play the character, the music. Uh, and like you said, have fun. I mean, the whole thing I did when I was a kid, like Wynton Marsalis had just recorded all the corn out of the solo. So I just sat and listened and I was like, can't do that. I got to figure that out. So I'd sit there and practice. And then, and then like I was 14 when I heard Phil Smith play Mahler five. And I was like, ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's what I want to do. Right. Sure. How do I figure that out? Well, I would sit there and, and I imitated the sound that Phil Smith made out in the hall. And I mean, it's not surprising. If you listen to recording me from high school, this is a recording of me playing the world youth symphony orchestra. Jim Markey was principal trombone. Uh, he's our bass drummer in Boston symphony. Ethan Behrman was principal horn. He's, he's assistant horn in LA Phil. I sound basically like I do now. And this was my junior year in high school. Like it's the same sound concept. It hasn't really changed oh. that much. Right. So develop your sound concept, listen to the best players possible. It doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be whatever, like listen to your teacher, right? Listen to your, the best examples possible and just imitate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. And the, the, the conversation was very rich for me and uh, I, I really appreciate it. I hope people listening got a lot out of it. I also want to thank Brandon Yoakum for his work on mastering this episode of the podcast. You can check Brandon out at epiphany recording studio.com. And I want to thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you in the next one.